Our guest, Dr. Herman Gordon, returns to Admission Straight Talk to discuss applying the pandemic as well as applying with blemishes like a criminal record or academic discipline. What qualifies him to guide you? He served as chair of a medical school admissions committee for four years. Let's learn more. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Accepted's founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dreams. Our guest today, Dr. Herman Flash Gordon, earned his bachelor's at Harvard and his PhD in developmental neuroscience from Caltech. He began teaching at the University of Arizona's Medical School in Tucson in 1991 and has been doing so ever since. During those almost 30 years, he also served as chair of the Med School's Admissions Committee for part of them. And since 2014, he's been a very popular admissions consultant at Accepted after leaving his position as head of admissions at the University of Arizona. Who can better guide you in applying to med school, especially if you have some issues to deal with, and everyone is dealing with the issue called COVID-19. So Dr. Gordon, welcome to Admission Straight Talk. Hi, Linda. Pleasure to have you on. Now, how did you get involved in med school admissions at the University of Arizona? Well, I think like so many uh, committee assignments, uh, I was drafted. (laughs) Okay. And uh, I was fine with it because uh, I thought it was an opportunity to help choose the students that I'd be teaching. Um, and then, uh, as I got into it, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, you know, you're, it's, it's such an important committee in med schools. Uh, it's uh, definitely the most labor intensive, even yeah. probably more than PNT. Um, but uh, you know, it's also extremely rewarding because you're, you know, you're changing people's lives by accepting them to med school, um, and. Uh, you know, and it's such a uh, in- intense effort. So you're working with your colleagues who are also, uh, you know, uh, really dedicated uh, to this task, and uh, and the outcome is great. You know, you you end up with this class that you really enjoy teaching and you feel good about uh, them becoming doctors. Um, so, it's not occurred to me that you're changing lives in multiple ways, not just the students, but the students that they're ultimately going to treat, the, right. the, the patients that they're ultimately going to treat. Yes, exactly, exactly. So it's kind of a, a chain effect there, really. Yeah. I don't think I don't think students thought about the intensive commitment ever of the of the admissions committee in going through this process. Well, uh, at the University of Arizona, like at many schools, uh, there are a number of students who serve on the committee as well, um, and that's uh, uh, very valuable. Um, and I think they get the word out uh, to fellow students, both at their own school and other schools, uh, at how uh, you know dedicated everybody is to this effort. Uh, you know, they they also communicate how much effort it is, uh, but it's also something I think everybody feels good about. Um, yeah. I I know that from uh, talking with colleagues. You know, it's like oh, I had to serve on this or that committee. You know, it's like you know. It was, um, but, you know, the one committee that everybody says was really worthwhile was the admissions committee. So, so it's, it's a lot of work for the applicants to apply. It's a lot of work for the admissions committee to seriously go through the applications. It's a lot of work on both sides. I think that sometimes that perspective gets lost. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, I, I don't know of anything else that really takes so much effort um, to apply to. No, it's, it's the most demanding. It's by far the most demanding of all yeah. the graduate, certainly the most uh, graduate professional, no question. Mm-hmm. Now, we are now towards the beginning of the 2020-2021 medical school application cycle. I know MCAS is open. It's going to start processing applications short, shortly. It's today, June 11th, as we're recording this. However, this cycle, unlike any previous cycle, is incur- occurring in the midst of the COVID pandemic. And that situation has presented several challenges to applicants. First of all, there's been no MCAT in March, April, or May, and I think it's hoping to start at the end of June. Um, There was cancellation of volunteer and paid positions that many students, applicants were hoping on to provide them with clinical exposure or just a different perspective on medicine. 
They're reporting pass fails for courses that they can no longer take for grades, again, because of COVID, the COVID shutdown. And there's uncertainty about the kind of medical education they're going to get online, offline, blended, are they gonna get the clinical experience that's so important to medical school students? So and what, what's your take um, on how they should be responding to these different challenges, okay? So let's take, first of all, the uncertainty surrounding the, the MCAT and the absolute unavailability of it this spring. Well, so I wanted to say uh, one thing in general first, okay. uh, which is, it is what it is. And med schools have to accept uh, a new class uh, of, of med students. And so they're gonna you know, roll with it. Um, and so the, the first question then was, uh, so uh, some well, how do you think med schools, right, how do you think med schools are gonna respond to the fact that many applicants couldn't take the exam when they planned, either the second time or the first time, and of necessity, we'll have to apply later in the cycle. I mean, that's a big concern. Right. So uh, they know this. They, they you know, um, and what AMCAS is uh, doing is um, allowing students to apply, even if they don't have their MCAT uh, score posted yet. And the schools then are sending out secondaries, uh, even without the MCAT. What they're saying is, once you get the MCAT in, then we'll process your application. But you can be building it in the meanwhile. Um, and, you know, we'll, it'll just go through uh, when it does. Um, right. it, it won't be too late. Um, you know, even people who are taking uh, the MCAT uh, through June and into early July, um, they're saying that they're expediting the reporting of the scores, so it'll only be two weeks. So worst case scenario there is the end of July. That's still very much uh, within the normal uh, season for MCAT. So right. uh, I, I wouldn't stress over that. Um, I think the bigger stress uh, I'm appreciating from applicants is if they don't already have an MCAT score and they take the test and it's not the score that they would have wanted, they don't have time to, re, uh, to retake the test. And yet they've already spent all the money and put in the application. So now they're gonna have to fly with whatever the score is. Um, and we'll just see how that happens. You know, the, right. as an applicant, it's like you just have to be aware and do the best you can. It's, uh, you know, everybody's trying to do the best they can. Um, so, you know, fingers crossed. And, right. Uh, I think well. it, not just medical school applicants, all around, <laughs> every field, <laughs> right. people are trying right. to do the best they can. Right. Um, any guidance on when applicants are better off waiting until next year, the 2021 22 cycle to apply? You know, who knows what's going to happen then? Um, I think uh, if you're ready, uh, I don't see any reason not to apply. Um, you know, these, uh, uh, for uh, doctors, these are exciting times. You know, this is, uh, you know, where you're, you're putting in everything that you worked for your whole life uh, in order to help people. And uh, as uh, med students, uh, you know, you're going to be part of that. Um, so I would, you know, if it were me, I'd say, yeah, I want to be part of this right now. Uh, I'm applying. Um, okay. So. okay. Um, I sometimes tell applicants, especially if they're concerned about like an MCAT score or lack of uh, uh, volunteer or community service experience, I'll say, look, I, you know, and they have something. I'll say, I think you have a chance now. I think your chance would be better if you beefed up this and this and this and waited a year. But, you know, you have a choice. It, you can, uh, you'll have no chance of acceptance if you don't apply you'll have some chance of acceptance if you do apply, but realize that the chance is improved if you, if you wait that year and you take these steps. So it's kind of like, what, what do you want more? A chance of acceptance now, even if it's not as good as a later one, or do you want to minimize your chances of having to reapply? The, the latter is really important, apply it next cycle. 
if having some chance of going this next next year is really important, then apply now. But also work to improve your applicate your your qualifications so that if you do have to reapply, you'll be ready and improved. So I I agree. Um... You know, the ideal applicant should have been having these experiences, uh, even starting as early as high school, but certainly through college. Uh, it shouldn't be, you know, oh, senior year, I'm going to go get my clinical experience. Um, or even junior year. Right, or junior year, right. Um, so, you know, if you're in that situation where you, you haven't had clinical experience yet, then uh, Definitely, you need to take at least a year, you know, a gap year uh, to uh, experience uh, what it is uh, to be, uh, you know, what your future career is going to be. That's what, that's why admissions committees put so much weight on the clinical experience these days, is that they want to know that the applicant has sorted this out, that it's really the future for them. Um, I remember uh, just once uh, in all my teaching, there was a student who uh, came and after two weeks, he said, oh, med school is not for me. And he left. It's like, okay, so now that's a slot that can't be filled because two weeks of med school have already gone by. And that means that's a doctor down the road who's not going to be there for, for their patients. So it, it's really serious. And that's why uh, it's so important for uh, applicants to have really, you know, vetted their own uh, career and, and know that this is what, the, what they want to do. Um, so there's that, there's, there, you know, there, there's for you uh, why it's important, but it's also important to the admissions committee to see that you've really done your job. You've done your, your work over a period of years. Um, now, in terms of, um, uh, not having access uh, to uh, opportunities. Uh, I am hearing from clients that uh, they are getting jobs as uh, scribes uh, and uh, even medical assistants. So these kind of jobs are opening back up. Uh, I've had several uh, now who uh, have uh, followed my suggestion uh, to try out the crisis text line. And every one of them has really been enjoying it. Uh, so that's a way where, you know, you're not face to face, but you are uh, interacting directly with a person in need and you are helping them. And that's exactly a clinical experience. And that, that's something that's fairly valuable uh, to admissions committees. So. This may not be quite as valuable, but I understand that uh, tracing physicians are, yes. are opening up on a volunteer basis. Again, I, from a clinical perspective, I'm not sure it's quite the same or quite mm -hmm. as valuable, but it still is at least related. It's something. Mm -hmm. And I think the other takeaways is from this, from, certainly from our conversation, but even more so from this, this whole situation is, is what you said. Don't wait to start testing your interest in medicine. Mm -hmm. If you're a freshman or a sophomore and you think that this is you know, first or second year of college, and you think this is your path, start testing that out now. Because if it's not, you can change. And if it is, you'll have a track record of, of these clinical exposures when you apply. And if something prevents you from doing so, whether it's an, a pandemic or, or personal illness, personal reasons, you'll still have had that experience. So that would be another takeaway, I think, from this, from this situation and, and the difficulty applicants have had this year in, in doing that kind of volunteer work and clinical experience. Um, how much experience, the other concern a lot of, I've read in some of the forums, talked to people about, is the whole pass-fail uh, situation that many applicants who were taking serious science classes, heavy-duty science classes, you know, their pre-med requirements, last semester for a grade and wanted the grade, instead had a pass. Any comments well, on that? Yeah, again, it is what it is. Uh, so uh, med schools can't reject it because it's a pass grade. Uh, if you were looking for it to improve your GPA, it wouldn't have improved your GPA by that much. Uh, you know, e even a whole semester of uh, pass-fail grades uh, isn't going to change things that much. Sure. Um, 
and the admissions committees have to take what they get. So. Right. Right. Um, okay. Do you think that that 2021, in other words, not, not this medical school first year, but the following starting medical school next summer will be a good or a bad time to start medical school? Uh, I think it'll be a great time. Um, there's going to be, uh, there already is, uh, you know, this focus on the importance of medical care in America. Uh, there's going to be a lot of thinking about, you know, ways to improve the system. Um, it's, you know, I, I think it's going to be very dynamic. The people, you know, the faculty are going to be talking, uh, the students are going to be talking, uh, you know, everybody's in it because they want to do good but how do you best accomplish that and yeah i mean it, it, <laughs> if i were young and going to med school i'd say yeah i want to go so hey, would you be concerned about like limitations on clinical exposure or limitations you know being taught online offline i know more and more that medical education actually is offline i'm uh, sorry is, is online not offline but um you know, any thoughts on that question? So, yeah, we'll just have to see. I, I know that uh, first years are being limited uh, yeah. in terms of their clinical experiences. Um, I think that there are ways uh, around that. Um, in, you know, in med schools, we'll be exploring those. I mean, I, I can think of one, which is to have uh, standardized patients who have been screened uh, for COVID. Um, there are uh, some really good videos of doctor-patient interactions, um, and those are good uh, reflective opportunities. Uh, you know, some of the videos are set up so that they're like house, you know, so it's like <laughs> how not to be a good doctor, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, and so there's, and actually you could use house episodes, um, but what's important there is the reflection, the discussion uh, about the nature of the interaction and what's yeah. important. Um, you know, students won't be getting the direct practice, uh, but I think that there are opportunities where they could get direct practice. So uh, there's certainly a need for working with the homeless. Um, and, uh, and, and those positions are open. Um, right. So it's, it'll probably vary a lot between, from one school to another. I think people will be very creative about trying to uh, make the most valuable experiences for students. Uh, and, you know, some will succeed and some will fail, just like any other teaching enterprise. And the ones that succeed, everybody else will try to copy and take credit for. And, <laughs> um, and uh, it'll all work out. But you know, I think that there's going to be, that it's going to be exciting. So no matter what, uh, yeah. It's going to be exciting to be in this sort of atmosphere. You know, hearing from your teachers who are on the front line, what's going on, you know, what they're up against, uh, that's going to be incredibly valuable. So. And what about for medical scientist programs, MD, PhD programs? Same, same thing? So, so they are trying to get, you know, the labs up and running again. Um, and sort of like the general economy, you know, it's the labs that uh, fund the universities. Um, so they have to make them work. Um, they're a little, it depends on the particular lab, but they are uh, easier to try to set up the social distancing uh, mm -hmm. in, in lab situations. Mm -hmm. um, I think what's going to be difficult are the, uh, you know, the medical studies, the clinical studies, right. where you have patients come in, and they're supposed to be doing something, you know, it, but hospitals are making it work, you know, it, it's, it's all a challenge, um, but, you know, people will figure it out. And um, by next year, hopefully we'll have a vaccine and that'll change uh, a lot of things. You know? Yeah, a vaccine, you think it'll take a year? By 2021? Think there'll be a vaccine? I'd love to hear. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, 
you know, Fauci's hopeful for the end of the year, but I think he's being optimistic. So. Okay. All right. How do you feel, and this is moving away a little bit from COVID and the, and the change situation that, that it's caused, how do you feel in general about, you alluded to, to that topic a minute ago? How do I feel about Gap COVID? years. No, no, not oh, COVID. Gap years. Gap years. Gap years. Okay. Um, med schools love gap years. Um, they uh, are an opportunity to uh, really get some uh, extensive clinical experience. So you want to use your gap year to get that clinical experience. Um, and the other thing that's good about them is that it gives you the time to put together a good application. You know, if you're putting together the application while you're in school, you're going nuts. You know, you're trying to keep your grades up and take all these hard courses and maybe do research and clinical experiences. How are you supposed to, how are you supposed to put your application together? Uh, you know, some people do and uh, good for them. Uh, but I think an awful lot of people today are taking gap years and med schools are absolutely fine with it. Uh, yeah. It's actually a good thing to do. So. Okay, and great. it will uh, make your life a lot saner. So yeah. if it were me today, uh, I would be taking a gap year. So. All right. I, yeah, that's basically how I feel. Um, you, were, we, we were, you and I were recently discussing the situation of a client who has academic discipline on his record. You had a succinct framework for handling that situation, which actually comes up more than we'd like to admit. Can you review it with us? So I, I figure that there are three important parts uh, that you have to get across in, I think it's like 1300 characters that you're given uh, for dealing with this. Um, so there's uh, reflection, um, there's contrition, and there's redemption. So the reflection is you need to spend some time uh, thinking about what it is you did wrong, why you did it, uh, how you would act differently in the future. Um, and then uh, you need, and then the contrition is after you've done that sort of self-analysis, uh, then you have to accept it, you know, that you are the one who was responsible. Um, and you have to make that very clear, right? And then the redemption is that you need to do something that sort of makes amends uh, for what you did wrong. So uh, let's take a very simple case, which uh, uh, admissions committees see quite often, which is uh, uh, getting caught for uh, drinking in the dorms. Um, and so one of the uh, you know, redemption activities you can do is outreach to fellow students, you know, to let them know uh, how serious it is um, and uh, why it's important uh, to uh, you know, follow the rules of, of the school and how this is, you know, especially for doctors, uh, the, it's very important that you be able to, uh, to, to follow the rules of uh, where you work. Um, and, so, and that starts. Uh, uh, you know, younger. And so your activities and, uh, you know, the mistakes you make and how you deal with those mistakes, those all reflect on your fundamental character and your ability to be a responsible moral doctor. Um, right. So you mentioned criminal, right? Well, yeah. I was, before so, we go to criminal, can we, can we just stop okay. to stay with a the uh, play the Lord Neary on campus stuff. I okay. assume that the, the um, so it's, it's basically reflection, contrition, which also implies regret. You didn't, you didn't actually say that, but I, it's kind of inherent to the word contrition. And then, and then redemption, doing something that, that shows you're working not only to correct yourself, but to help others prevent the same error. Um, is Sometimes you hear contrition expressed like, I, you know, I'm, I'm in, I don't want to go through that again. Meaning that it's not so much you're, you're acknowledging that you did something wrong. It's just that, that the, the 
reaction was so severe and so unpleasant that you, you wouldn't go through it again because you don't want to have to deal with the outcome. As opposed to, you know, I thought about it, I did something wrong. Is that difference important? That distinction important? Uh, well, yes, at two levels. I mean, one is the moral level, right? And then the other is uh, the admissions committee level that they, they want you to understand uh, why it was wrong. Uh, not, you know, it's like, oh, I don't want to be punished again. Uh, it's like, you know, <laughs> there's something I did wrong and this is what was wrong about it. So. I don't want to go to, I have to go to my room again. Uh, right. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, now, would you advise different, let's go back to the criminal record, would you advise different at all if it's a, a criminal matter? Let's say a DUI. Okay, I guess we're kind of stuck on drinking today. Right. Or in, in the so, academic context, it could be um, academic ac action because of cheating. Right. Um, So uh, yeah, cheating's uh, pretty serious. There's going to have to be some pretty significant um, contrition and redemption uh, to overcome a cheating charge. What would be uh, redemptive for that? Uh, again, uh, outreach activities uh, are always good. Um, I uh, had a client uh, who went through this and uh, she did uh, outreach to uh, high school students in the community where she grew up and explained, you know, how important it was uh, to, uh, you know, <laughs> follow the high road. Um, and, you know, both from the moral as well as the career perspectives. Um, and so, you know, all of that counts. Uh, sure. Now let's talk about the uh, like, let's say uh, you had a felony, right? That's, yeah, that's going to be almost damning for getting into med school. Uh, that's going to take 10 years of, you know, being out in the world and helping people. It, it's, uh, the missions committees are very risk averse. And if they can choose somebody who doesn't have the felony, why should they choose you? You know, what's, What's special about you that has overcome uh, that felony conviction? Um, let's go back to DUIs. I remember a discussion on our admissions committee where uh, it was somebody who had two DUIs. You know, one was during college and the other one was about four years after college. Wow. And <clears throat> the discussion was, you know, no way, no how. Uh, this person is old enough to have known better. They had already been through it, and yet they still, uh, uh, you know, they still succumbed. Um, and also just the, uh, you know, there's this sort of stereotype of uh, doctors drinking too much. Uh, and so they just want to avoid that no matter what. So it was, it was both the drinking part of it. Uh, well, it's three things. So it was the drinking part. It was that it was the second time and it was uh, well after they had graduated from college. It's so there was, right. So there was no way we could let them off. Um, I think drinking and uh, marijuana charges yeah. tend to, you know, if, if it's during college, especially during the first two years of college, they're sort of like, well, you know, it's a uh, bad judgment and uh, they haven't done it again. And, you know, they've got the, the appropriate uh, contrition and redemption. It's like, okay, you know, it's not a big deal. But th those things start happening after college uh, and they become much more serious. So. You can't blame immaturity when you're in your late right. 20s. Right, yeah. right. All right. Now let's let's move on in the application cycle since we're almost at secondary season. Um, what's your advice to applicants, to your clients for responding effectively to secondary applications? So the secondaries are even more important than the primary and they're more work. 
Uh, the secondaries are how you get your foot in the door and get the interview. And if you look, uh, you know, at the statistics, it's about uh, one in 10 to one in 15 uh, to get that interview. And then across schools, uh, once you've got the interview, it's about a one in three chance of actually getting accepted to that school. So it's all about getting your foot in the door, getting invited for the interview. And a large part of that is based on the secondary because the secondary is about your match to the school. The schools, uh, you know, you may be a great candidate, but if you've got no connection to the school and you haven't like, you know, uh, drilled down on their website and you don't know what it is that you would get out of attending that school, uh, they're not gonna be interested in you. They don't want to waste an acceptance on somebody who's unlikely to come. So, okay, great. so, Thank you. so the secondary that's most important is, you know, oh, why this school? Why do you want to come to our school? Or what? And then a, a variant of that is, what can you contribute to our school? Yeah, I always say that the, the primary is like a thirty thousand foot you're about your fitness to be a physician, mm -hmm. and the and the secondary is much more about your fitness to be at a particular program. Mm -hmm. It's really zeroing in much more. And what about advice for interview prep? So uh, interview prep, uh, sign up for three sessions with me. Okay, go uh, for it. We'll include a link. Right. Okay. Um, uh, I think interview prep is very important. Even people who are very personable uh, have, have benefited uh, from extensive interview prep. Uh, part of it is, uh, you know, just sort of getting used to the situation that you're not having a conversation, you're being interviewed for a job. Um, and uh, so there are particular topics that you wanna be able to hit uh, you want to be spontaneous and yet you want to be prepared. So uh, for typical interview questions like, you know, why do you want to be a doctor? Uh, you should have three things lined up, right? So you have bullet points and you go through, you know, you give your bullets and then you go through and you explain them. And then uh, you allow for a conversation with your interviewer. So you don't want to, you know, just be blabbing, uh, you know, have a spiel that, uh, you've got all prepared and you have to run through it and then you're done, right? You want to have stopping points where the interviewer can ask you a question and maybe uh, steer the course of the conversation that you're having. Um, so you frame it with your bullet points, but then you leave it open for a dynamic discussion so that your interviewer can ask you the questions that they want to know the answers to. So if you go in with your spiel, it may not be what they wanted to hear. <laughs> but if you give them the opportunity, uh, then uh, it will flow very naturally. So, and since you prepare, you'll also be able to respond to the natural flow of the conversation. Right, right. And all of that uh, I, you know, benefits from practice. Sure. And uh, I know, uh, you know a lot of people will do like one interview prep. Um, I have found it makes such a difference to do three. Okay. Um, and the people who've done it, uh, you know, really say, yeah, though, that made a big difference because after the first one, you know, I, I thought about it for a couple of weeks, you know, and I practiced with my friends and then I came back, right? And then I learned more uh, from the, the next session. So. Okay, we'll definitely link to, it's called the Gold Mock Interview Package and we're mm -hmm. going to link to that from the show notes. Um, any last words of advice? towards the end? Let's see. I think it's more first words of advice, right? Just okay. <laughs> I thought you'd given a lot of advice here, so it's not going to be the first ones. It may not even be the last one. Right. But, uh, so, uh, you know, you want to be starting as early as possible, like your freshman year. Uh, and, I, you know, I, I do have clients who, uh, you know, are signed up and getting advising, uh, uh, starting as freshmen. And, you know, it doesn't have to be like, you know, every month, it can be like, you know, you check in every semester. Uh, but it's like, it, 
it can be really, really helpful, especially like, oh, you know, I have a choice between these two different clinical opportunities. Well, it turns out one of them is patient facing and one of them is not. Well, <laughs> that's a very important distinction, right? Um, so, um, right, and then just, you know, be on track. It's like, so that when something like COVID comes along, it doesn't really make any difference to your preparation. You're ready. So. Right doesn't derail you. Absolutely. Because if you were from your freshman or sophomore year pursuing community service, pursuing clinical exposure, perhaps taking on a research project or two, and COVID struck, maybe took your MCAT the summer, you know, before, it wouldn't, it wouldn't derail you at all. To the contrary, you'd be all ready to apply right. the minute MCAT, MCAS opens. Is there anything you wish I would have asked you? Uh, let's see. What's the difference between being on an admissions committee and being a consultant for accepting? Consider it asked. Go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I talked before about being on the admissions committee, and uh, it's uh, it's a very rewarding uh, uh, position to be in. Um, but uh, I think it's even more rewarding uh, uh, consulting with clients and helping them uh, optimize their story and presenting themselves. Uh, so that they do get in. You know, I saw so many applications when I was on the admissions committee. It's like, we knew this person was going to be a good doctor, but the application stunk. <laughs> it's like, we can't take them based on this application. And so, uh, you know, not that, not that a lot of my clients have applications that stunk, but, uh, you know, anything you can do to help uh, strengthen that application and, and get your story across more effectively uh, it, it just makes such a difference. And, you know, being part of that, uh, I have found to be very rewarding. That's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. <laughs> I'll have to ask it next time myself. So thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, no, it is, it is very rewarding work. And as you said, you're, you're changing lives, not only the lives of the applicants and the clients that you work with, but the lives of the people that they're going to ultimately treat and help. Right. So, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. It's been delightful. Um, listener, if you would like to learn more about Dr. Herman Gordon or take advantage of his expertise in medical and grad school admissions, we're going to link, include links to his bio and contact page in the show notes at accept.com slash 372. Listener, thank you too for joining Dr. Herman Gordon and me for our 372nd episode. If you find the show worthwhile, I have a suggestion for you. Subscribe. That way you won't miss any of our future shows, whether with admissions directors, writing experts, test prep pros, fantastic admissions consultants, or alumni doing great things. You can find subscribe links in the show notes at, you guessed it, exhibit.com slash 372. Oh, one last quick reminder, don't miss how to create successful secondary applications, the free webinar taking place on July 9th at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. Save your spot at exhibit.com slash 372 webinar. Thanks again for coming. This is Admission Straight Talk produced by Accepted, and I am your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week. Bye.